We believe that this book is the inspired Word of God. We believe in a simple looking book that can change lives, and we'll see that this morning even as we read. There's life in this book, and so we'd love for you to have a copy of God's Word. And with that in mind, let's dive in this morning. We're going to be looking at the first ten verses of Acts chapter 3. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we glorify the name of Jesus together this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to have sung the praises of you and of your son, Jesus, through the power of your spirit. Lord, we thank you for this story this morning, the, the true story of you healing this lame beggar. We thank you for the truth that it is even today for us. Lord, we pray that we would trust you, we would believe you, that you would open our eyes to see the glory in this story this morning through your word, through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, inevitably, if you're like me, every Christmas, there's that one person on your list who seems to have everything, right? And so every year, it's just this big challenge to figure out, what do I get this person? And so if you're just a really creative gift giver like myself, that means you go to Google and you start Googling things like buying a gift for the one who has everything. And there's fantastic lists, right? I mean, there's great ideas. There's, there's articles, there's, there's checklists, there's, there's ideas to get you through at least eight or ten years worth of, worth of gifts. And you can extend your uh, apologies to Jessica for dealing with my gift giving uh, year in and year out. But, but just everything from gift cards to, you know, staycations, donations in someone's name, just, just on and on the lists go. But what's not quite as popular, what you don't find a lot of articles about, uh, are what do you give the gift, what do you give to someone who has nothing? What do you give to someone who has nothing? That's what we see this morning. That's what Peter and John experienced this morning. Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. The passage is opening, flowing straight out of Acts chapter 2. The end of Acts chapter 2, the phrase says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And you go from this panoramic sweeping chapter. Acts chapter 2 is one of those epic chapters in the Bible, right? The Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, and 3,000 people are saved, and you see this rich fellowship. And then you see signs and wonders are happening through the apostles. And you have this summary statement that the Lord is adding to their number day by day. And, it, and you start with this panorama, right? This giant panoramic picture. And yet, Luke pauses right here as we open chapter 3, and he goes from the macro to the personal. He says, yes, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Let me, let me tell you one of those stories. This is one of those people. And that's a fitting thing, right? Because the mountainous story, the mountainous story of God's advancing gospel, they're going to be walking through Acts as we walk through Acts, God's advancing gospel, it's, it's comprised. It's made up of individuals. It's made up of individual stories of people who've experienced the loving power of God through the people of God who are freely sharing what they've freely received. That's, that's, that's what this whole thing is made up of. It's made up of people. It's comprised of people who experience the loving power of God through the people of God who are freely sharing 
what they've been freely given. And that's what our story is about today. That's what Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 is about. The passage breaks down, the story breaks down into three sections. The first section that you see is this debilitating need that, that, that this lame beggar is dealing with. You see this prevailing name in verses 4 through 7, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you see this spreading wonder. That's going to be the last part of our section, this spreading wonder at the name of Jesus. What does this man, who is this man, and, and what are these signs that can be accomplished through his name? First three verses, as I mentioned, this debilitating need. One of the, one of the main characters to be open this chapter is this lame beggar. This is a guy, uh, he, his situation is one we're meant to feel. We're meant to, we're meant to, to it, it, for it to impact us. He has no hope in this life. Zero. There's not a program that he can apply for. There's not, there's not a class that he can take. The, there is no uh, journalis, journalistic uh, person who's going to come and do an overcoming success story on his life. This is a debilitating need, and it defines his entire life. It defines his existence. It's a physical disability, but it's all encompassing for what it meant for his life. It was something that he's powerless to change. He can't do anything about it. We see that he is lame from birth, it says in verse 2. We don't know how old he was, but he was at least a, a young man at this point. He's described as a man. So this isn't just a temporary, don't worry, things will get better tomorrow. This is a prolonged period this man has suffered. From day one, he's suffered. And as far as he knows, going into the future, every day is going to be the exact same as the day before. He's living a life of isolation. His physical disability has cut him off. It's cut him off uh, relationally. You can see that here. He's carried to and from and laid daily. At this point, when it's the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So odds are he's been sitting outside in hot sun probably all day long as people come and go to the temple for prayer. So he's cut off relationally. He's probably having to pay people to carry him and place him there. And he's left there on his own. He has no realistic chance of ever having a family. The things that we look forward to in a lot of ways, he has no chance at that. He's cut off financially. He has no ability. He has no skills to earn a living. You, we take for granted that we can get up and the stability that it brings to be able to go to work and make a living. This guy doesn't have that kind of stability. He's, he lives an uncertain future financially. He goes meal to meal. He, there's, there's, he's making the most of every opportunity because you don't know when the next opportunity is going to come. He has to beg for alms every single day. But the one thing you can say that he's put himself in the place most likely to receive some help, hadn't he? He's, he's laid outside the temple gate, which is, that's, that's the most popular, the beautiful gate is the most popular thoroughfare going into the temple every single day. And so he's having to make the most of every opportunity because he doesn't know if, if one meal is going to lead to the next meal. He, he's, as people go to the marketplace, they may be willing to share a little bit, but if you're going to the temple, you're much more likely to share, right? Because there's a couple of people around you who think, man, they, I, they want them to see me giving to this guy as I'm walking in, plus... You know, maybe God will be a little bit happier when I walk in if I give to this guy. And so he's, he's, he's smart with how he approaches it. He puts himself most likely to receive some help, but he's cut off financially otherwise. He's cut off socially. He's passed by. People, people you, get to, you, get to, you can picture the scene, right? People are just coming and going. And this guy is just by the side of the road. He's, he's uncomfortable at best. And at worst, he's an annoyance. Asking for every single day, he asks me for something. He's not treated as a human being with value. It's horrible as those things are. And we're supposed to feel that. You're supposed to understand and, and, and kind of feel what this guy's life, because it's a true story. This guy was a real existence. He's a person who was dealing with this every single day. We're supposed to feel what he's going through, but it's, and as terrible as those things are, maybe the most devastating part of this is that he appears to be cut off spiritually. There was this prevailing thought back then that if someone was born with a disability, and, and Jesus' own disciples uh, suffered from the same false belief, that, that it, clearly either in, in uh, John 9, a man is born blind, and Jesus' own disciples come to him and they say, well, who sinned, this man or his parents? That, that could be the only reason why this guy was born blind. Probably the same idea was applied to him on a regular basis as people walk by. Maybe he believed that about himself. People thinking this guy must be worse than the rest of us because he's dealing with this and I'm not. It doesn't appear he was allowed to enter the temple courts. He's laid outside. He's left outside the gates. And the irony of that is that the saving presence of God, the one physical location on earth, 
in all of the earth, the one place where the saving presence of God is supposed to be, it's inside this temple, right? It's right on the other side of that gate. It's so close, and yet it feels to him probably like it's so far away. You're not allowed in here. There might as well be a sign on, on the gate that says, not for you. You stay out there. Everyone else can go in, but you stay out there. And so you have a guy, he's completely and utterly broken. He's completely and utterly broken. We're supposed to feel the, the helplessness. He's helpless to change his circumstances. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of a helplessness in small ways, but <clears throat> it, it, you're supposed to feel the helplessness of this guy. And if you've been given a temporary grace of physical health, if you're able to get up in the morning and, and, and go take a shower, turn off the coffee pot, drive yourself to work, we're not supposed to take that for granted. That's a physical gift. That's a, that's a grace of God. We, we're, as we were saying this morning, we wake up, we have 10,000 reasons to thank the Lord for his grace in our lives. Don't take it for granted. And may we, as a people, who know that everything that we have is a gift of grace. We're aware, we should be aware that everything that we have, every good and perfect gift has come from the Father. It's, it's an undeserved gift, even physical health. We, as a people that know those things, we should be quick to be compassionate. We should be quick to be generous to those who are dealing with physical suffering, whatever, whatever form it looks like, knowing that it's not because that we're, we were better off than they were, but this is the grace of God. Yet, as so often is the case in the Gospels, and in this case in Acts as well, this man's physical, represent, his physical situation, it's, it's a tangible representation, right? It's a tangible representation of ultimately a spiritual need. And that is a need that we all share. So maybe you don't have a, a physical need right now, but the spiritual need that this man had, we all share. Listen, as it relates to God, we are all born sinners from birth. It says a man lame from birth. We, you could put in there, we are all born sinners from birth. You can't see it on the outside, but it's brokenness nonetheless. It's affecting everything that we are. It is all-encompassing. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are all suffering from a life-defining, debilitating need. Listen, apart from Jesus Christ, the condition that you're born with, sin, defines your life. It defines everything about who you are, and you can't even see it. This man at least knew his situation. His physical disability led to him being aware of his needs. What's interesting about this spiritual condition is that oftentimes spiritual lameness can also be spiritual blindness. We refuse to admit our own need in this, in this way. We refuse to acknowledge it, and therefore we never ask for help. This man knew a situation, and it led to his willingness to ask for help. Charles Spurgeon says, we must experience our brokenness first before we can experience healing. Just because we've been blessed with physical health or material wealth, the things that the world counts as what it, mean, what it means to be, have the good life. Because we've been granted those things when other people may not have been. In God's wisdom, he may not have been. Don't let the pride of that begin to blind you to the real problem that we all have, the real disease that we're all born with. Because at the end of the day, we are just poor, lame beggars, aren't we? We're just poor, lame beggars being carried to the side of the road. Just like this man, we're supposed to daily put ourselves in the position most likely to receive help. Put yourself in the position most likely to receive help. Because it's in the asking. That's the glory of this passage. It's in the asking that this lame beggar encounters probably the most unexpected outcome he, could, he could actually couldn't even imagine. The most unexpected outcome. Because get this, the saving presence of God... Saving presence of God was no longer in the temple. The saving presence of God was with his people. It's with his people. The curtain in the Holy of Holies that separated God's presence from the people was ripped in two the day that Jesus died. Jesus is the new, final, and ultimate temple of God, and he is present. Listen, he is church. He is present in his people as they go forward in his name. Matthew 28 tells us that God has given all authority and power to, to this name of Jesus. And it's in his name that we, his people, are being sent. And Jesus says himself, he promises, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Jesus was not inaccessible inside the temple. He was not inaccessible to this beggar. He was not inaccessible to the need that he had. He was with Peter and John as they walked into the temple that day. And what we're going to see here is that changes everything. That changes everything for this man's life. There's this prevailing name that is going forward. It's very possible that, and that's verses 4 through 7, it's very possible that Peter and John, they may have walked past this guy hundreds of times, back and forth. I mean, if, if you think prayer is three times a day, seven days a week, that's possibly 21 times a week this guy may ask for their help. And yet, for whatever reason, this day when they walk by, and this afternoon, this time at this day, the appointed time that God had, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit just prompts them to stop. And, and, and in obedience, they stop and they look at this guy. And it says in verse 4 that Peter and John direct their gaze at the man. It's more than just this passing glance. We're trying to turn the other way that so many people have done for this guy. It's just this gift of faith that comes from Christ and is directed towards the need that this guy has. It just reminds us of Christ, doesn't it? During his earthly ministry, how often was he quick to turn his eyes towards those in need? He saw the suffering of those around him. He recognized it. And get this, the gaze of Christ, it always changes things. It sees what others can't see. It believes what others refuse to believe because it actually sees true reality. We think we see, but the gaze of Christ truly sees. And Peter this day, he's not too busy. Maybe he's been busy every other day, but Peter on this day, he's not too busy to look in the direction of need, to see others as Jesus saw them with that gaze. And it leads to this wonderfully just intimate exchange between Peter and John and, and this beggar, right? To the man who spent his entire existence probably with his eyes downcast. He's known as that lame beggar. People probably didn't even know his name. Not worth a second thought. Not a second glance. Peter instead says, look at us. He stops and he says, look at us. And maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time ever, he looks up to see a caring set of eyes looking back at him. Somebody who's seen his need. You see, the beggar couldn't go into the temple. The cold reality, the cold truth is that he wasn't worthy to be in God's presence and neither are we. And yet this God-man, Jesus Christ, has come to us. He's seen, he saw this beggar every single day. He saw him asking for help every single day. And you know what his answer was? His answer was to send his people in his name. That was the answer for this beggar. Church, we could spend an entire message on the next two sentences, right? These next two sentences I love. I spent a while just thinking about them. Peter says, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, what I do have, I give to you. Giving to meet physical needs is a, is, it's a wonderful thing. We have a lot of examples in the New Testament of that being commended. People donating for, for phys, meet, to meet physical needs out of love. God loves a generous giver. That's, that's a fantastic thing. But more so than the largest donation that you could make to any, any one organization, the world needs more than that to encounter Jesus Christ. And they do so when they encounter those of us who have been entrusted with the gospel. That's what they need, and that's, that's what they encounter in you, you who have been entrusted with the gospel, and in me. Church, we have the precious promises of God. We have the things that we've sung about this morning. They're true and real. We have received freely by the grace of God. It wasn't because we were smarter. It wasn't because we figured it out. It wasn't because of, of luck. It was, we didn't go and find Christ. It was the other way around. He came and found us. And it's in that way that he sends us out. It's in that same going and seeking that he sends us out, that same desire. And true, we may hold this treasure in jars of clay, because that's what we are, but we hold it nonetheless. It's in us nonetheless. And there are many around us. There are folks outside the walls. There are folks in your office on Monday. There's folks in your family, whatever it may look like in your classroom. There are folks out there who need what we have. They need what we have, and you have, and I have, this treasure in jars of clay. 
Peter commands in his next sentence, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The statement itself is supposed to be stunning. It's just supposed to be overwhelming. The name that he even uses seems in that time to be very, very contradictory. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Christ is a title for the Messiah. The Messiah is coming from God. He's the promised one. A Jew would know what that meant. A Jew at that point in Jerusalem would know what that meant. He, Jesus Christ, he's the Messiah. He's coming from heaven. But you just said Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, we know that town. I've been to that town, or we, we kind of avoid that side of town. That's the wrong side of the tracks. Nazareth, back then, wasn't the place that everybody was trying to move to. You kind of tried to scooch around it, and you're traveling. You, went, you, went, you took the long way around it. Nazareth wasn't a place that good stuff came from. You're saying, this, you're saying this Christ is the Messiah. He came from heaven, but this Jesus of Nazareth, he's a carpenter's son. He's a carpenter's son. He's, he's a blue-collar guy from the wrong part of town. You can't be both in, right? That's a contradictory statement. I can't believe you would even use that, put all that together as one name. And not only that, this is, isn't that the same guy that not that long ago, just a few months ago, isn't that the same guy that was convicted by our highest courts? Wasn't he a criminal? Didn't he die? Didn't we watch him suffer and die on a tree? And, and, and we know that everyone who dies on a cross, that person is cursed by God. Are you talking about that Jesus? The high priests and the elders, they've already told us that guys like Peter and John are dangerous. They're crazy. They're walking around saying this guy's come back from the dead, and we know better. This is a hoax. You see, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus was supposed to have been an embarrassment. The name of Jesus it was supposed to fade. It's supposed to be a laughing stock. It's supposed to be another failed Messiah. And yet in the glory of God, it's precisely because Jesus Christ humbled himself. It's precisely because he took on human form and became Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. It's precisely because he was obedient to open shame to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's precisely because of those things that God has bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of human history, folks, including this man's life, all of human history is purposely planned by God. It's purposely planned by God so that the name of this one man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will be made greater and greater and greater and greater to the glory of God. That's what we're going to see in Acts. This is the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter's declaration is a statement that Jesus is alive. It's a statement that Jesus is alive. This is one of the first works. This is validation. This is vindication that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the promised Messiah. This is the fulfillment of the, pro of the prophecy from Isaiah 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And then look at the sequence, and I, this is what it says. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And get this, then shall the lame man leap like a deer. Which, by the way, from standing still, a whitetail can clear a fence six feet tall. Just to put that in perspective. Maybe that promise from God is what was echoing in Peter's heart that morning. Maybe the Holy Spirit, that, those words, he just heard them in his heart and his mind. As he walked by, he heard, the lame man shall walk like a deer, or leap like a deer. Maybe that's, what, maybe that's what prompted his response of faith, to turn and say, look at us. We don't know, but we know that something, whatever it was, Peter believed he believed what the promise of God in this particular situation, for this particular person, for this particular need, he believed it. And in faith, he turns and, and looks towards that need. So we see that the power is in the name of Christ. But we as believers have the joy of responding in faith to help meet those needs. I love this quote from John Stott. It says, the power was Christ's, but the hand was Peter's. Now, think about the privilege of helping this guy stand, right? 
Think about the privilege of that. Imagine being Peter in that moment, reaching your hand down. And, and think about the faith of this man. He reaches back. Why in the world, as a guy who hasn't been able to walk his entire life, would you reach your hand back to try to stand up? From a guy that you don't know. Think about the faith that this man has. I, years ago, I, I was a superintendent on a job site, and I had an accident. And uh, long story short, my, my right foot is completely uh, put back together with titanium almost. And uh, <clears throat> I remember I was, I was off of it for several months, couldn't walk. And I remember the first time the surgeon told me, okay, now put some weight on it. First time he takes the boot off, takes the cast off, he says, put some weight on it. It was a step of faith. Because the last time I had taken a step, it didn't go so well. I went straight down. It was a step of faith. And that began a long journey of trying to build strength back, rehab. And most of you, many of you know what that's like to have to go through something like that, building strength back. And yet this guy in faith, and, and you see the miracle. If you've been through that process, you know the, this unbelievable miracle. The end of verse 7 says that his feet and ankles are immediately made strong. Not only is his paralysis cured, but power flows through Peter in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth into this man. Amino acids immediately build muscle and tendon strength. He immediately has these gross and fine motor skills that, that takes years for us to develop. They're immediately granted to this guy in the name of Jesus. He leaps up is what it says. It's not just they, they helped him and he's got, now he's got a long road ahead of him. No, he immediately leaps up. In seconds, this guy's life is given back to him. We're supposed to, this is a miracle. In seconds, this guy's life is granted back to him. Things that even if he could stand up, there's no way that he should be able to leap up. It's impossible. And that leads to this final section in our passage. There's a spreading wonder. A spreading wonder about the name of Jesus and what is it, the things that are happening in this guy's name. This holistic transformation from the beggar that we met in verse 2 to the, guys that we, the, the, the guy that we see in these final three verses, verses 8 through 10. It's, it's a stark contrast. It, it, it's, it's different. It's 180 degrees. It's different as north is to south. We're supposed to go on this journey with him, right? He felt his need. You're supposed to go on this journey with him. This is a true story. Imagine being this guy. Imagine the weight that's lifted off of him. Physically, he goes, from, as, we, as we read, he goes from being carried around like a child to leaping like a deer. Emotionally, he goes from being downcast, separated from others, to filled with overflowing joy. Relationally, he goes from sitting outside, being passed by, to walking into the temple with probably his two best friends that he's known for all of 30 seconds. May not even know their names at this point, but we're go I'm going with those guys. Spiritually, he goes from being cut off in the outer courts to praising God. And that is a fitting thing. That is a fitting thing because when a God changes a life, one of the first things that flows out of that life is praise. And it draws a lot of attention from those around. Verses 9 and 10, it says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They knew exactly who this guy was. They knew he, what, this wasn't a scam, because one, he, he was lame from birth. And two, you wouldn't pay people to carry you around all the time if you didn't absolutely have to. They knew this was a real thing. The unimpressive beggar. The guy that wasn't worth their second look. The one that everybody just kind of passed by. This, this guy is now the one they're all drawn around. He has become the demonstration of God's glory in their midst. The weak has become the wonder. Is that not true of us? Is that not true of us? 1 Corinthians 1, it reminds us of this. It reminds us how true it is. Paul says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might, might boast in the presence of God. Paul, in his own words, get this at the end of his life in 1 Timothy, he says this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. After all the missionary journeys, and all the churches that are planted, and all the suffering in the name of Christ, and all the wonderful miracles of Paul's life, he says, look, the transformation of my life, the transformation of my life was meant for one thing, so that others would see, my life would be the platform, so that others would see the patience of God towards me, the chief of sinners, and they would believe in him too. They would come to trust that too. It really hit, hit home this week. How often do I wish to be seen as impressive before men? I had a silly example. I'll tell you this is how far my ridiculousness goes. Um, we had, Jessica's car was in the body shop, and we had a rental vehicle. And so, this is, having never refueled this rental vehicle, you know, as you pull into the gas station, you know what the dilemma you're facing is, right? Which side of the car? I got a 50-50 chance. And so I'm thinking, it's always on the driver's side. It's always on the driver's side. I'm going for the driver's side. So I pull in with authority. Pull straight in. Don't, I don't stop to check. I don't look. I looked in the mirrors. There wasn't any, there was, there, it wasn't, I couldn't see. So I thought, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be that guy. So I drive straight in. Well, as I get out of the car, you know, I just get out of the car. I'm going to fuel my wife's car, you know. And the guy sitting in the truck beside me, his windows roll down, and I have, he has this amused look on his face. And I knew immediately. I knew immediately I'd guess wrong. So I sheepishly get back in the car, back it up, pull over, and pull in the other way. He goes to pull out. His window's still down. And, I, and something inside me has to know, this guy has to know I'm not that incompetent. He has to know that I'm, that I'm more impressive than what he just saw, right? Because this is not, that was not impressive. So he's, as, he drives, as he drives by, this is what I do. Rental. It's a rental car. He needed to know that. How often? You laugh, but you've done it. How often? Do I wish to be seen as impressive before men? When a mature, a mature guy like Paul, I'm immature, when a mature guy like Paul, he said, instead, he's much more interested. He's much more interested that people see the example of Jesus' patience in his life. And if his life serves as nothing more than a platform for that, then, then all the better. You, church, have been such an encouragement to me. I've loved to hearing testimony after testimony from folks in this church who said, man, if you knew me before, if you'd known who I was before, you can't, you, you can't contribute any of this to luck or education or living better. This is supernatural. The grace of God in my life is supernatural. The transformation, it's not complete, but the transformation from who I was to who I am now can only be the grace of God. You are quick to point to that, and that's an encouragement to my soul. It's a great disservice to the gospel. And it's a great disservice to unbelievers when we as Christians attempt to look more impressive than we actually are. The lame beggar couldn't hide who he was before. He couldn't take credit for what had happened to him. People knew this guy. They knew this guy. But what they were impressed with was what had happened in his life. It says they were, this is exactly, and they were amazed, not at him, they're amazed at what had happened to him. He didn't care, though. He apparently doesn't care. He was healed. He was better. And all that he cared about was enjoying God's goodness. Our need is the avenue through which God's grace and power can be displayed. Apparent self-sufficient Christians can dam up that river. Let us be quick to enjoy God's goodness in our life. Let us be quick to point that every fruit, every little bit of patience or whatever it may be that God has born in our lives, it all came from Jesus Christ. It all came in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
And let us be quick to do it even if we're not that impressive in the process. We aren't awe-inspiring. But church, he is. And he's at work in our midst. He's at work in our midst. You see this as a recurring theme throughout Acts. People are in awe when Jesus is at work in the middle of his people. It's his power, but he is choosing to manifest it through the church, through us, unimpressive people. And one of the main goals of these miraculous works is to open the door to preach the gospel, to tell people about the real miracle. Notice that just like in chapter 2, we'll see next week that Peter's going to step forward and he's immediately going to begin talking about who Jesus is and what he did. The door that's open to the spreading wonder, it opens a chance to preach the gospel. That was the point of this miracle. That's what happened in chapter 2. That's what he did. And that's what's going to happen. We'll see at the end of this chapter. The miracles, as awesome as they are, do not save anybody. The gospel saves. The glory of a lame man standing is unbelievable. But it pales in comparison to what Christ has done to save us. Why? Because feeling physical healing of paralysis, it's a simple thing. It's a simple thing. It's, it's, over, it's, it's awe-inspiring, but it's a simple thing compared to bringing a dead heart to life. And because God can display his power at any moment to meet any need beyond anything that we ask or imagine without costing himself anything. But when God miraculously met our greatest need, the one we were born with, the one that defined our life, our need of forgiveness, our need to be reconciled to him, adopted into his family, when he met that need, it cost him everything. The power to heal is temporary, but the power of the gospel is eternal for salvation to all who believe. Even if miraculous healings could somehow become commonplace in the midst of a church, which seems like it was happening on a regular basis in this particular church, the gospel in and of itself can never lose its all. If you're a Christian, you are a new creation. What God has done in your life, what God has done in your life is greater than what he's done for this beggar. Our need was, was deeper and what he's done to meet it is better. Church, you are, you are the greatest display of the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This room is filled with miracle upon miracle, filled with life upon life, testimony upon testimony, zoomed in story, personal testimonies. He's walked into our hearts, hearts that hated him. They were cold towards him. They hated him. He's taken us by lifeless, helpless fingers, and he's commanded us to live. He's commanded us to live. He commanded you to live. And just like this man, you, maybe you remember exact time, maybe, maybe it was a season for you, but just like this man, you ultimately leapt up. You ultimately leapt up and you followed after him, your new best friend. Not maybe not understanding everything, but praising God. Because a lame man walking, a lame man walking is pretty impressive. It's awe inspiring. But it ain't got nothing on a dead man walking. So let me ask you a few questions in closing. Are you willing to be needy? Is that okay? Is it okay for you to acknowledge helplessness before God? It's a hard thing to do, but it's necessary. Only the needy are sitting by the side of the road asking for help. If he hadn't acknowledged his, his need, this beggar, he never would have met Peter never would have had his life changed. If you're here this morning, you never thought of yourself as suffering from any kind of problem. Maybe everything's good for you. Life is going well. It's exactly per plan. Never thought of yourself as having any kind of need. This morning, Jesus says he came to call the sick because the ones that are sick but, but don't know it, they don't make a doctor's appointment. He said he's the physician. He came to call the sick. If you've been a Christian for a long time, 
Like Paul, I invite you to do something that's very countercultural to what our culture tells us to do. I invite you to take some time and remember your need before the Lord. To remember who you were before God walked into your life. To remember your need even now. The transformation that's underway in your life even now. The things that God is doing in your life that you've needed him for and he's, he's fulfilled in your life even this week. Take time to remember that need that he's met in your life. The transformation in our life is meant to inspire all. Our testimony of of his grace, it's his stage, it's not ours. His forgiveness on display in our lives, the change in our lives can give hope to a needy world. But a parent's self-sufficient, self-righteous Christians can almost feel like they're pushing the lifeboat a little bit further from a drowning man, a little bit further outside my reach. I, I can't be that. Like Paul, let us be so secure, so secure of our place in Christ that we look for even small chances, even little opportunities to point out that it's God's power at work in our lives. We have those chances. Are you willing to be needy? Question number two. Have you been looking for someone with the power to save? Have you spent your whole life your whole life looking for the one to save you. Maybe you're here this morning and you felt your own helplessness. You, you, when I'm talking about this guy, you recognize what that means. You felt that about yourself. You felt your helplessness. You felt that deep need that you have. The more you try, the more that you realize that there's nothing I can do about this. I can't get back to God and I can't fix these relationships and I can't do this and I can't do that. Let this passage encourage you this morning. God has given one name under heaven for all people by which they can call upon and be saved. That name is the name we heard about this morning. It's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And maybe at one time you were convinced that Jesus was that person. That he was who he said he was. But over the years, doubt can begin to creep in. Cynicism can begin to, to work its way in. If you're experiencing a prolonged period maybe of suffering in your own life for one way or another, those voices can get louder. They can begin to echo back and forth in your, heart, in your head. If, if you're dealing with that this morning, doubts about who Jesus is, I, I just want to tell you right now, one, be, be encouraged. You are not alone. You're not alone in dealing with that. John the Baptist, of all people, he's sitting in prison, right? He's sitting in jail, going through, through suffering, his own personal suffering. And he sends two of his disciples to Jesus. And it's a wonderful story. He sends two disciples to Jesus. And, and their question, they, what they were sent to do was to ask a very simple question and then a follow-up question. Are you the Messiah? Or should we look for somebody else? He has these doubts. Are you, are you the one that we're waiting on? Jesus turns to those two disciples and, and, and he says, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. No, John, you don't have to keep looking. You don't have to keep looking. The Messiah has come, and he's come to save you. The lame man in this text, even after Jesus died, got up and walked. And if that happens in the name of Jesus, even after his death, then he truly is alive. And he's exactly who he said he was. And he's there to save, even this morning. I want you to hear that reassuring voice. Maybe, maybe those doubts and cynicism have begun to chip away, but I want you to hear that. I want you to look at this text this morning. This is what Jesus said to look for. When you're looking for a Messiah, you want to look like for Messiah-like things. This is a Messiah-like thing. Have you been looking for someone with the power to save? 
third question is that I was asking myself over and over again this week. Is it treasure? Is it treasure? Silver and gold I don't have, Peter says. But what I do have, what I do have, I give, I give it to you. He believed that what he had been entrusted with was worth so much more than the counterfeit that this world would try to make a counteroffer with. He believed that he had real treasure. Yes, it's true, we're just not that impressive. But we are unconditionally and eternally loved in Jesus Christ. Do you feel that this morning? We sang about it. Do you feel it this morning? That hasn't hit home for a long, long time. I just invite you back to the first time it dawned on you. That wasn't just Jesus loves the world in this generic way, but in this passionately perfect, personal way, you realize Jesus loves me. He loves me. Because my experience has been, the more that I'm able to grasp that, the more that I'm able to feel that deep in my heart, the more that I believe that, the more that I lean on that and see it to be true, the more that I desire to share it. It's a treasure to me, and I want someone else to experience it too. That's been my experience. Is it a treasure to you? And you know what's interesting? As, as, we, desire to treasure, as we desire to share those things, it's, it's interesting how often that desire is going towards those who are most in need. Most in need of a treasure. So this morning, is it treasure to you? As the song says, his name is healer of your deepest scars. He's father of your broken heart. His name is mercy, power, freedom. Oh, his name. Oh, his name. His name is Jesus. I have no silver or gold, Peter says. But what I do have, I give to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this man's story this morning. We thank you for the truth that it is. We thank you for your power on display for us to look at thousands of years later in a different continent and still realize that you are exactly who you, you say and you, Jesus is exactly who he said he was. I thank you for the encouragement that is for our soul. Lord, I pray for anyone who is dealing with any of these needs this morning. I pray that this morning that they would, they would be able to come and cast those needs upon you because you truly care for them. Lord, we pray that we would be transformed into a people who treasure the gospel. Lord, I just thank you for how true that is already. I thank you that you pray that you would continue to do that in my life and in, in the midst of this church. Lord, I pray that we would be quick to point to that gospel to those that need it. And Lord, we love you. We look forward to meeting this man one day and rejoicing with him. In Jesus' name, amen.